But uh, we're going to change things up a little. Uh, we're going to look now at sort of the, um, uh, the rise of machines is what I call it. It's not the title of the talk at all. It's just uh, something the way I sort of interpret it. Um, but really looking at algorithms, uh, machine learning, and how to, and how to uh, do that with uh, time series data. And uh, Danilo from uh, AWS, his evangelist there, is going to come and uh, lead us through that. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. So one thing that we saw today is that you now with time series, we have a huge amount of data. And data is really useful if you can understand it, if you can get actionable information from it. And that's where algorithms are, are important. Uh, actually, algorithms are even more important than that. I love this definition that I found on the BBC Byte Sides website. This is an an online training for young kids that tells you use code to tell a computer what to do. Before you write code, you need an algorithm. And that algorithm is the list of rules that we need to apply to solve a problem. And if we move into the domain of machine learning, uh, algorithms will be even more important in the future. It's really the capacity to choose the right way to analyze data and to understand it that will make a difference in the future. And this is Pedro Domingos. He is the author of The Master Algorithm, and a really interesting book about the quest on finding the ultimate learning machine, the ultimate learning platform. And according to him, there are five tribes of uh, algorithms uh, that people is using, depending on where you get your inspiration. Uh, so in machine learning, there's people that come from uh, neural networks or uh, neuroscience. Uh, of course, there's lots of statistics, uh, Bayesian networks. Uh, as well, psychology, uh, logic. So uh, those are all different ways of approaching a similar problem. But if we want to start simple, probably the basic algorithm that is still very powerful is linear models, building linear models. You can build linear models just for doing regression. So you want to understand, for example, uh, estimate a numeric variable. How much time does it take from my house to come here? or to do binary classification. So you want to know, for example, this email is spam or not. It's something that most mail clients now implement using some sort of machine learning. And uh, with time series, this works very well because uh, this is uh, an example of supervised machine learning. So when we have lots of data, previous data, that has uh, a label, and the label is the same label that we want to predict, for example, in the future. So let's say that we want to build a machine learning model to predict how many bikes are rented in, for example, in the public bike uh, sharing scheme of a town. We have our own uh, list of events from the past, and we want to predict what happens today at 4.30. Uh, how does it work? Well, uh, with machine learning, you can have, uh, in this case, a linear model, and you need to optimize it. But before starting to use the algorithm, we should look at the data, because we look to the data through the eyes of a human. Sometimes there's more information that is not easy to understand. For example, look at the dates here. They tell us a lot of information, because, for example, maybe it's a Sunday or a Monday, it will be a very different use case on how you use bikes, uh, if you use them for commuting or for pleasure. Uh, maybe the weather is also influences a lot, so that's something we must put on. And one thing that we should think about before going to the algorithm is feature engineering. So uh, thinking about the features through the eyes of the machine and maybe expand this information. So from a single date, I can take out if this is a, a Sunday, so the weekday or a Monday. And probably I'm also interested in knowing if this day is a, is a public holiday. For example, those, those days were Easter and Easter Monday. And Easter Monday is quite a different Monday than traditional Mondays. Uh, so you need to learn that. So now that we expanded the information, probably the, the, the learning algorithm will be able to catch up much faster and, and be more precise. And to catch up, we need to define an objective. So usually in machine learning, what we do, we define an objective function. And this objective function takes in two different components. The first component is what we call the loss function. So the idea of how good is my model to predict what I want to predict. So normally you want to reduce the error in the predictions. 
But this is not the only important thing because it's very easy to build super complex things in machine learning. So it's very important to add another term. It's usually called the regularization term. And this term will measure the complexity of your solution. And you want to keep the complexity as low as possible. So the good balance between being good in prediction and without being too complex usually gives the better result. Let's see this, for example, in action. Let's see that this is a graphics that tells you uh, the user, uh, the interest of some, uh, of some user for some topic. And we see that over time the interest of the user is rising. And I want to build a model to understand this interest. So I can build this very basic model here. There are some fitting, but probably there's also a lot of error because we can see lots of points here are outside of my model of my line prediction. Uh, so probably the, the, the loss function is high here, so not a good model. I can build this other model where you see I'm fitting the data very well. It's a, almost a perfect fit, but probably it's too complex. It's not really understanding what is happening. And if I send the new data, probably the same model will not work because it's what uh, we used to call an overfit. It works very well with my subset of data, but it will not work with new data that I add. Probably the best balance is this model here where I have a little bit more error, a little bit more loss function, but the simplicity, so the, the, the regularization term is very small. And this model is actually telling us something. It's telling us that something happened in this time T1 that changed the perception of this topic for this user. I mean, I have now I have an actionable information that I can use to understand what happened. And when we have this objective function, the idea is that we must to minimize. And here's just a lot of mathematics. Uh, normally what we do, we use uh, gradients. Gradients is the extension in multiple dimension of the concept of derivative. And we usually have a function that is not just in three dimensions. It's a function that is probably in maybe tens, hundreds of dimension, but we still take the gradient, we take the opposite direction of the gradient, and we try to go down to find a minimum. Hopefully we work to find a global minimum, the best minimum, and this is minimizing the error and the regularization. But this was working very well, but when the internet came on, it was not working with some problems that start to be very common, such as item recommendation. So we in Amazon know that problem very well. Uh, and also with click prediction to understand where a user is going to click next. Uh, in fact, there was also a big prize by Netflix uh, just before 2010, trying to understand how to optimize recommendation. And the idea here is that we don't have a lot of data. So with linear models, we need a lot of data. Here probably, if this is the users and the items, let's think that this is the Netflix catalog. Probably uh, it's very difficult that a user saw all the movies on Netflix and could rate all of them. There's lots of holes here, much more probably that you see in this table here. Uh, and this is not working well with, uh, with linear models. So, but it, from a, uh, from a mathematical point of view, actually, those are not zeros. Those are really unknown points, so you don't know how to estimate them. But if we think that those are zeros, this becomes a sparse matrix. And mathematics tell us that a sparse matrix can be decomposed in the product of smaller matrix. And starting with the ideas, uh, people invented these factorization machines, where we start with a linear model. Sorry for the mathematics, but the linear model is just some weights that multiply the, the variables that you have. And with linear models, you need to optimize these weights. So this is the loss function, basically, uh, the error. Uh, with this term, that is a little bit complex, but the idea here is that we take a new vector, uh, a new list of vector, and each product has its own vector representation. This sounds strange, but the idea is that if we have movies, we have objects that we sell, they can in some way be represented by a vector. And this vector uh, will have uh, some features that is a number of features that we must invent. So for example, let's take movies. Let's take movies and let's say that I take four features to represent a movie. I can think, for example, that one feature is telling me how much action there is in a movie, how much romantic is a movie, how much thriller, how much horror this is in a movie. And now I have some sort of representation and I can compare movies together. And if someone likes a movie that is similar to another movie, I can extend this uh, recommendation and fill those holes that were there. Uh, of course, this Terms here is something that I invented. So the platform itself, if you use factorization machine, will just fill your table with numbers. It's almost impossible to understand the meanings of the different features, but this gives us an idea. And now that we have this 
representation in a vector, we can compare the vectors. And the product that we were so, so, so in before is just the dot product, for if you know mathematics. And the idea is to see how much those vectors are close to each other. So if two movies go in the same direction in this three, four, five, six dimensional space, then probably these movies are similar. And if you like one of those movies, then maybe you can like the other one. And this is where the product was, was important. So if we go back here, you see that this term here was taking how much you like a movie. If you, there is a movie that is similar, so those products there was big, then I take that feedback uh, to the, to, for, the, for uh, the similar movie. And this is something that helped a lot, but over time, all their algorithms were invented and people start to have another idea. Maybe if I have different ways to solve a problem, and one way is not always better than another, I can use more models together. And this is the concept of ensemble. Ensemble is, was very popular, especially a few years ago in machine learning. So I build different models, and then I build a way, a more smart way to take the different output together. And then someone had an extreme idea that is called boosting, and said maybe if I, instead of having three good models, I have hundreds of very weak models, maybe I can use all those models together and still get a good result. And that's the idea of, uh, of boosting, uh, of gradient boosting. And to give you an idea, let's say that I want to understand if someone uh, likes a specific item. I can build a very basic recommendation system that looks, for example, at the age. If you're younger than 15, you probably like this item, maybe it's a video game. If, you don't, if you're uh, greater, no. If you're male, then you probably like it more than if you're female. So this is a very weak model. Probably it's not really working very well, but then I can use this together with another model. And another weak model can be maybe, uh, do you use your computer how often, daily? Yes or no? If you use it often, then probably you like it more than if you don't like it. And then I can start, now that I have two models, those models are built as very simple trees. Uh, I can start and say, okay, for this one, I add up the two results. For this one, I add all the results. And I start to get more meaning. If I start to have hundreds of these small trees, the final result is a good prediction. So this approach also is quite interesting. But if we're talking about machine learning today, probably the main reason uh, is the advance in image analysis, image recognition, for example. Uh, and this is due to neural networks. And specifically, what was invented a few years ago was a way of building neural networks that is different. It's called convolutional neural networks. It works a little bit closer to what our eyes are doing. So basically, when we take an image, we don't feed the image to a neural network immediately because that would be a, lost list, a long list of numbers, not correlated. But we use convolution layers that extract features. So the first layer will look if there's maybe some lines, diagonal lines. The second layer will look for circles. And then the circle maybe is an orange circle. And then the next layer will look for pumpkins because they are orange circles with some specific features added. And in this way, you can learn and extract features in a more intelligent way. And this is something that was state of the art. It's still state of the art. Uh, currently, there's a new trend here. It's called capsule networks. They are still prototypes. There's nothing working in production now. And capsule networks works in a similar way, but instead of giving numbers from one layer to the other, the output is again a vector as before, and the vector with the direction is used for creating a dynamic routing. So basically, I extract a feature that is not a number, it's a vector, and then I look for the next layer uh, not for a static layer, but at the layer that is accepting the, the vector that has the similar orientation that my output. So in this way, you can have a dynamic routing. And this seems to work very well, even better than the state of the art of today, but it's still too much complex and not usable in production. And another problem that is quite interesting, and this applies also to time series, is sequence to sequence. So if you have a sequence of data that you want to transform in another sequence of data. So common representations here are machine translation. So I send English and I want to get German or vice versa. Uh, text summarization, this is a harder problem. So I send you a long text and I want to get the summary. Uh, I, I would love to have that at school because it would have helped me a lot. And also speech to text. Speech to text is something that we experience very well with platforms like Amazon Alexa. I send a, a speech, so I have an audio file, and I want to understand the text, the speech inside this audio file. And an audio file is still uh, 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 an ordered list of numbers from, uh, from the 
this algorithm perspective. And here, we, uh, as Amazon, uh, released this open source uh, implementation based on an algorithm that we invented, it's called SOCI, uh, that works using, again, neural networks. And the idea here is to, uh, to have this kind of architecture. So normally, sequence to sequence works with an encoder that takes, for example, the audio file or your uh, English text. And then a decoder will transform this into your desired language. So I want to understand the speech, the, the translation, and so on. And the idea here is to create an attention layer in the middle. And the attention layer will take care of the context, because the same word in different contexts has different meanings. So the problem is you can't work a word at a time. You need to take the context uh, while the, 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 the sentence or when, when we speak. And this is something that we do always. So when we speak with each other, sometimes we miss some letters, something, but we, our brain automatically feels that based on the context. So it, it was saying this, so probably that was what it was the, what meaning. And now we do something similar with the machine, and the output is something like that. So for example, this is German to English translation, uh, Das Grundhaus, sorry for the German speaking in the room, uh, translates to the greenhouse, and we get a matrix that tells us the probability that each word goes into another word. And if we have a very long sentence like this, this will also change the order of the words. Because for example, sprechen, uh, that translates into discuss, it's the last word in the English sentence, but it's much earlier in the English translation. So these mechanisms of attention can also use this attention to take and change the order of the, of the result. Uh, a very typical, uh, and we're getting now into the uh, unsupervised machine learning side, uh, algorithm is cluster, is those for solving clustering. By clustering, mean, I mean we have lots of data that represents something, maybe my customer, and maybe I have one million of customer. I can't understand one by one all my customer. I want to cluster the customers and understand maybe if they behave in similar ways. Uh, and this is what uh, k-means can help you do. So with k-means, uh, this is something quite old. Uh, it goes to in the 50s, in the 60s. Uh, what we do, let's imagine that these are the points that I want to cluster. Again, this is two dimension. Probably if you take your customer data, each, each customer has 100 uh, data points that you can extract, so it's probably 100 dimensions. And the idea is, okay, I want to cluster this together. So how can I work? So well, the first step is to create uh, three centers uh, for three clusters that I can start at random or there's some optimization to do that. And then I will assign each point to the closest uh, center. And now that I have some as pre assignation I can recompute the center point of each cluster. And so the, cl the centers will move. And now, I, again, I can assign each point to the closest center. So a few will change color. And again and again, until the, the centers will not move a lot. And this is the way we can cluster lots of information and find if there's pattern. And this is unsupervised. So you can run this on data that has no label. That Normally, it's very difficult to, to have a meaning, but you can understand if there are grouping and patterns the, inside. Another uh, algorithm that is quite popular is PCA. So pre and this is part of the, another problem that is dimensionality reduction. And again, this is something that we always do, because even if we live in a three-dimensional space, if I have to tell you where I am on the planet, I just give you latitude and longitude, because altitude is something that is not changing a lot, and it's also something that you can infer, because if I'm in London, probably unless I have a few hundred meters where I can be inside in a height in London. So it's something that we do, and it's also useful for machines, because if we have 100 dimensions in our uh, data points, maybe that's too much for my computation, and I want to understand if I can simplify things. And to do that, we work in a way similar to this. This is actually the oldest algorithm. I think it has more than 100 years. It was invented for similar purposes, and this is the original article. And if we have these points here, it's pretty clear that it's much more important if I tell you the position in this direction of the point. Basically, I'm telling you almost where the point is, and then if I also tell you the position in this other direction, I'm adding very little, like the altitude is not telling much compared to the position on the Earth. So this is the basic idea of PCA, and it's something that uh, is also interesting because PCA, as an algorithm, will give you the most relevant 
component first, then the second one, and so on. So if you have lots of data that is difficult to understand, this will automatically give you the most important component, then the second one, then the third one. And another uh, open problem that has been worked on, and this is something still old, 50s, the 50s, the 60s, is what is now called topic modeling. So topic modeling means that if you have, for example, a large corpus of text, for example, all the emails of your customer support, and you want to understand what are the top topics that are discussed in your customer support so that you can take action and solve those problems first. Uh, this is actually something that started in genetics because in genetics they had a similar problem. They were looking at the genomes of all the people on Earth and they wanted to understand if there were common genotypes. And this was useful to understand, for example, the migration that happened before we start writing history. So we don't have knowledge of what happened at the time. Uh, but uh, the same algorithm works on genomes and works in written language. Uh, and uh, the idea here is let's take, for example, a, a simple book that is only using those words. Eat, sleep, play, mew, and bark. So if we have this very simple book, the output of topic modeling would be something like that. I find that there are two main topics. The first topic is probably more relevant for the word sleep and mew, and the second topic is more relevant for play and bark. So as human, we may understand that probably the first topic is talking about cats, and the second topic is probably talking about dogs, but this is not something that the algorithm will tell us. It will only tell us that those topics have some relevant words. So for example, in your emails, you can understand what are the key products or the key features that are creating troubles for your customers, maybe because they don't work or maybe because they don't know how to use them. So that's something that you can use uh, very efficiently. And this has also been implemented more recently with neural networks. So it's a completely different implementation that gives good result, but different result. And what can you do if you have two algorithms solving the same problem in two different ways? You can build an ensemble. So you can take both and take the best of both. So that's something that you can do. Another open problem is time series forecasting. And this is very important when the time series is related to a resource, like the CPU of my servers or uh, the water that I need to keep my factory below a certain temperature. So for this, we invented an algorithm inside Amazon. It's called DeepR. It's based on neural networks. And as the characteristics that is quite unique that can work on multiple dimensions together. So for example, if let's take a, a use case that is not related to Amazon, an e-commerce website. Uh, so if you have an e-commerce website, the, the load on your CPU, uh, the number of items you sell, uh, the number of deliveries that you start, uh, they are all related because they start for the same reason. So with DeepR, you can train a single model with multiple time series that are correlated. And this single training can be applied to multiple dimensions. It's quite useful because you need less data to create a, 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 a good model. And uh, the idea is that you get an output like this. So in the, the, the dark line here is the actual data. Here in the middle, we start building a prediction using deep R. And deep R will give us a prediction. It is the, I don't know if you can see, there is a thin line here in the middle but it will also give us an area of confidence. For example, an area where we are 80% confident that we will stay in the, uh, in the future. Uh, if, uh, for example, this is probably what you should use to estimate how much resources you need for CPU, for uh, water, or for uh, anything that, that, that you need. And another quite interesting uh, uh, algorithm is uh, random cut forest. And it's something that you can use for anomaly detection. Anomaly detection is super important. It was mentioned today multiple times. It can either tell you if something is wrong in your own monitoring or if something is, is wrong in the things that you are monitoring. And uh, what we try to solve with random cuts forest, this is an implementation that we did in Amazon, is to work not on a finite set of data, but on a continuous stream of data. So a, a stream of data that is not finite and you start without any knowledge and then you learn as it goes. And the idea here, as the name suggests, is to create lots of trees. Uh, so let's start, for example, with this very simple <laughs> data set. And it's quite clear that the orange point is a little bit of uh, an outlier here, uh, and it's not in line with the other dots that I have. So what uh, Random Cut Forest does is that we'll find the line, or in multiple di dimensions, the hyperplane, that splits the data into different trees 
and makes these trees more unbalanced. So normally in computers, in computer programming, when you build trees, you want to have data ordered and sorted. Here you want to create the most unbalanced. Then when new data comes in, you see which data will try to unbalance the tree. So this is a binary tree, so you try to fit the data in the best way. The one that creates more unbalance in the trees as it goes. And it's random because we work with samples based on the, on the size of the, of the data. So it's not absolute, uh, but it works uh, very well for more uh, generic purposes. And this is an example of how you can use random cut forest on a public data set. This is a time series that comes from the taxi in New York City that tell us how much the taxi in New York City has, are, are being used over, uh, I think this is one year. And this is the output that you get from random cut forest. It will find all the anomalies. And specifically, there are a few anomalies are uh, New York's Eve, so the New Year's Eve, so the, when everybody's celebrating and they drink and they don't want to drive home. Uh, there's also, I think, the, the, the big snow and all stormy weather that you get in New York here. But there's probably more anomalies that I want to get. So that's a problem with anomaly detection. Or you need to understand what's the right level of anomaly that you want to get. So the best way to fine tune this with this algorithm is to use a trick that is called shingling. I don't know if you're familiar. It's a trick that is used with time series. And the idea is that if I have a time series that has some periodic data, like the tax in New York is periodic. Every day you have a similar pattern, not the same. You replace this point in the time series with a, a list of, the, of n endpoints. So for example, if p is equal to 3, you replace the first value with the first three values, so you have more information. Then you have the second, the third, and the fourth, and then the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. So each data point becomes bigger by just aggregating with the one that are following. But lots of algorithms appreciate this, especially if there's periodic behavior, because you're taking some part of the periodic behavior inside each data point instead of having this spread across different data points. And if you apply this, for example, in this case, I think we use three as, a, as, a, 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 as the size of the group. You can see that you can take only two, the most two critical anomalies that you have on the same data that are exactly, I think, New York's Eve and the big storm that New York had last year. And that it created lots of issues. So shingling, it can be a good way to extend the information of your uh, time series without making it too much uh, complex. And just to give you an idea, this is how uh, it would work on a, on a Jupyter notebook. So on a Jupyter notebook, you, uh, you can visualize your data. Uh, and the human eye is usually the best way to understand uh, and to find anomalies of patterns in data. So data visualization is always the first step. Uh, then zooming, we can find more information. And then by uh, starting the evaluation, we can train uh, the model. Uh, we can train the model, and after the training, we can start to build the predictions. Uh, and the, predic the first prediction is the one that I just showed you. And then we can use shingling. So the, 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 uh, I wanted to see the, how much uh, it was, I think, with P equal shing sites. Uh, uh, I don't see it here. I think it was three and then we get the, the simplification. So this is a Jupyter network. It's a very good way to understand your data and, and process your data and, uh, and find information. Last couple of uh, algorithms, and then uh, uh, this last one, it's word to vec uh, The idea is that we, we said that we sometimes want to work with data that is not numbers, like words. Uh, and in this case, what we do with machine learning is it's called embedding, so transforming data that is not numeric into digital information. word to vec is pretty a standard. We have a, an implementation that can do that very fast. It's called uh, blazing text. And when you have this information, the idea is that you can get the context from words. So if you take five words, you can understand what is the context of these five words, and this is important. Or the opposite, from a single word, you can understand the, the, the context that this word is probably bringing with itself. And the idea here is that each word will be represented again as a vector. And if two vectors are similar, they have similar meaning. So for example, cappuccino and espresso, probably they have two similar vectors. And then if we take something like tea and croissant, you start to get farther away. And then if you take something completely different, like a chair, probably the vector is, is different. Uh, 
and to, to solve this problem, we need to, to, to have lots of computing. So that's why we work on the implementation, on the scaling. And uh, this is because our customer, uh, they really need to be able to, 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 to work on large data sets. So we have customer processing terabytes of information daily, building, uh, for example, uh, millions of uh, advertising prediction per second or other customer, they need to rebuild their machine learning model every day and they have maybe one hour to do that. Otherwise their business is working on all the information. So how to solve that? Well, uh, machine learning works like this. You have your data, you have your machines where you run your training and then you get a, a model. Uh, to do that, we need to be able to scale because uh, it's the only way to, you can grow it to scale horizontally, but uh, scaling horizontal is not easy to manage and there are other complexities. So I, I was quite quick in my overview, but lots of those models, they have their own parameters. So when you want to build a model, you need to define some parameters. Those are usually called hyperparameters. And the idea is that these parameters are chosen, then you build the model and then maybe the model is not working. And then again, you try other parameters and again, and this is wasting your time because instead of building the model once, you need to build it maybe 10 times to find the right implementation. Another problem is incremental training. Maybe you have a model that is using the, the last two weeks of your time series to build a model, then another week passes and then you need to rebuild the model with the last new two weeks and again and again. So the idea that we had at Amazon was, let's think about streaming. So can we build a machine learning problem uh, from a stream of data, like I mentioned before for, a, for anomaly detection? We can keep a state, and as the data flows, we update the state and we can update the model. So this is, this is an approach that solves lots of problems because now incremental training doesn't need to rerun the training again. You just need to add the new week to the training. Uh, and uh, we need, of course, to support the GPU because that's something that accelerates uh, training uh, and to be able to be distributed with a shared state because uh, most algorithms, they need, they are not stateless, they need to have a shared state. And uh, at this point, what we can do is that the state that we build for this stream of information can keep more information than what normally does. So for example, we can take some information that tells you what happens if you change the hyperparameters without having to run it again and again. And that means that now also modern selection doesn't need you to run multiple models, but you can run a single model and then you can find different solutions by just tweaking on the results of the state. So we built this last year uh, using a container-based architecture and it's called Amazon SageMaker. And it works like I showed you before. So you can explore your data using Jupyter Notebooks. You can import data very easily from different sources in multiple formats. You can then run your training in a scalable way uh, using those features. And then we can host the model as an API and then, then you can use internally uh, or even externally if you want. And we support all the engines that our customer asks us to support. So basically we support TensorFlow, Apache, MXNet, PyTorch, Cafe 2, and also some standard interfaces such as Keras and also Gluon. Gluon is a joint project between Amazon and Microsoft. We're working to create an easy interface for machine learning. And uh, we also put in open source lots of tools that can help you integrate your own solution. So if you want to customize the TensorFlow or the MXNet container, uh, or you want to, we, we provide an SDK to work from Python, as I did in the sh uh, show before, also from Apache Spark. So from Apache Spark, you can integrate and use uh, SageMaker for training. And this is an example of what one of our customers did that I love it because it's, it's slightly different. So I don't know if you know Music's Match is a mobile app uh, that uh, helps you follow the lyrics of songs uh, as you listen to them. So you can listen to the song and see the, the lyrics. Problem is that uh, they wanted to do something different. So what they did is, uh, normally music recommendation works on item based. So if you like this song, and normally people that likes this song likes this other song, then I suggest you this other song. This works normally, uh, but they say our users, they are interested in lyrics. So we can analyze the lyrics of the song you like and find songs that have similar topics or even similar tone in the lyrics that the one you listen to. And so they build this with SageMaker and they're experimenting with this. And I like it because it's a different way of suggesting and learn, finding new music. 
So just to wrap up, uh, machine learning is really algorithms, and that's the core. Data, your data, that's the big asset, and also tools that make you use those algorithms on those data in an efficient way so that it's uh, efficient for your business. If you was a little bit inspired by some of the algorithms that I talked today, this is the complete list on how they classify, and this is the algorithms that for, uh, in SageMaker, we implemented the streaming platform so that you can use those very fast uh, relearning and uh, framework. And probably there's something in your business that can relate to at least one of those algorithms. Think about that. It can be a good way to, to find a new perspective on what you do. Thank you. Uh, if there's any question, I'm more than happy to take them. Or if you prefer, I'm, I will be here for, for uh, at least uh, until the next break. That I think is after my talk. So. <laughs> I scared every. Give huh? you a stupid question. That, yeah. Uh, no. Let's imagine we're using a time series data. Everybody here is using time series database, right? So it's a kind of repository for a big amount of data. How do you see to process the data from an input? Do we work directly on input? Do we move the data out of input? Or should we enable streaming? How we can uh, you apply? So this is, this is quite a common problem. That's, so having data in an endless series of information, so that it's not finite that you say, okay, this is my customer database, I just process this. That's why we focused a lot in working on this uh, streaming platform and this streaming approach. This is, I would say, uh, quite unique. So there are two main approaches. So the old approach and the standard one is that you do periodic exports and you can do that in an efficient way. For example, maybe you have uh, so on Amazon, you would use Kinesis, for example, but you have some streaming tool that will extract information maybe hourly, daily, weekly, and then you aggregate those data for the last, I don't know, two days, two weeks, two months, and, and redo the training periodically. And this also depends on how your training is affected by time. Sometimes some models can live for some time. Some models must be retrained every day because they must keep up with what's happening. Uh, and that's the traditional approach. There's no way to overcome it. With the streaming approach, you can create a single model and you can stream the data. And at any point in time, you can create a model very quickly. So it's not immediate, but it's quite quickly uh, from that uh, stream at that point in time. And since we had this problem inside Amazon, that's why we work hard and also with our customer to build this pipe. It's what we call the pipe input mode that can be enabled on not everywhere. We're working on extending this to other algorithms. Uh, so these are, just to be clear, the built-in algorithms of SageMaker, and then you can extend with TensorFlow, Apache, MXNet, uh, and then you can use everything from Spark or from uh, Python, uh, Jupyter Notebook. Okay. Did I answer your question? Okay. Out of all the I'm, I'm involved in a business where we're trying to predict um, failure detection. So if a certain pump, for example, in our case, its exhaust pressure builds up with other metrics going up. How can, or which algorithms are best suited for that to tell that uh, maybe this pump is about to die within a week? Yeah, yeah. so it, actually there is no silver bullet, uh, but uh, of course uh, the, uh, it, uh, the, the idea of forecasting on time series is of course applies because maybe you can uh, measure in some way the, the probability that they can break. Uh, also, uh, clustering is something that is used. So if you have the old data, you can try to understand if you can build clusters that map with the probability that they are going to break. Uh, uh, so this is probably the, 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 the two ways uh, I, I would start to work. And here again, the, the important part is how much data you have uh, in the past and how much is relevant. Because of course, if you change things, then maybe the data is not relevant again because you change the way a physical monitoring works or, uh, or, or a physical product works. But uh, I, I would start with those two. Uh, it, this is part of the problem that I was mentioning at the beginning, feature engineering. So if you think only of using those arguments as they are here, you probably say time series forecasting is the only way to use. But if you think that the features, the, the data you have can be remapped in different ways, 
probably you can, for example, remove time and group data without considering time, if time is not relevant, or maybe you take only the hour because the hour tells you something that happens outside that can impact your, uh, for example, your production. Uh, so this is the way you should think. And, and uh, machine learning is always an iterative process. You never study, build the model, and, and finish. So the idea is that you start and create your first model, then you use the objective function to m validate your training, and you get, okay, the accuracy is 72%. Now I try a completely different approach and see if I get something better or, or can be improved. And if you get different models, you can use ensembles. This is very popular, so you can mix and match different results because they can improve the, the overall quality. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Daniel said he'll be downstairs um, answering all the questions. So, you know, what, what I just had one question for you is this on the test? We did a test at the end. Is this, is this part of the test? <laughs> um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll study up on that. Should we take a, uh, another break uh, to 2.45 and then be, be back here for the last of the sessions? Thanks. <laughs>